What's going on guys? Welcome back. Today we're going to be checking out quantum computers. So this one should be fun because, you know, you might have heard that I am making this Cal uh, VPN, which is going to be the first commercially available quantum proof VPN ever in the world. And yeah, it's going to be awesome. So if you're interested in that, you should come sign up in the description. You might be like, why is this important? Well, you're going to find out in this video. All right. So stick around and I will give you some, give you the scoop on what's coming. So you've probably heard about quantum computers before. They've been in the news a lot over the last five years or so. And you've probably heard about how Google, Intel, IBM, all these companies are trying to build one, uh, a useful one that is. We already have them. They're just kind of crappy at the moment. Um, I think Google and IBM, they're trying to build superconducting qubit quantum computers, which I don't think that's going to work out very well. They're having some problem with what's called error correction. Um, we'll explain that. I think Intel is looking like a like a winner. They're trying to build one uh, with silicon, essentially. Like uh, you, your phones and computers, they have all these semiconductors in them, transistors that are made out of silicon. And if we could open up uh, that industry with the infrastructure already in place uh, to, you know, then just slightly change it for quantum computing hardware well that would be a game changer and that's what intel is trying to do and that is all thanks to a bunch of breakthroughs coming out of australia so i'll tell you all about that because i've been following this for years um the last five years australia has really been leading the quantum computing breakthroughs uh so i can't wait to tell you about that in this video for most of our history human technology consisted of our brains fire and sharp sticks while fire and sharp sticks became power plants and nuclear weapons, the biggest upgrade has happened to our brains. Since the 1960s, the power of our brain machines has kept growing exponentially, allowing computers to get smaller and more powerful at the same time. But this process is about to meet its physical limits. Computer parts are approaching the size of an atom. To understand why this is a problem, we have to clear up some basics. So computer parts have already made it to the size of the atom. We actually created the first atomic scale transistor in 2012. So that is literally a transistor, a semiconductor made out of atoms. Uh, and just the end of last year, we created the world first integrated circuit at the atomic scale. So a quantum circuit. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you more about that soon. So we've already done that. And you can actually compare... Uh, our sort of quantum computing trajectory to classical computing and it's actually pretty similar so stay tuned i'll tell you about that actually maybe i'll just tell you now so in what is it 1946 we uh created the first transistor and then 1957 we created i'm pretty sure the first uh integrated circuit so and then five years after that we had the first sort of commercial uh computing product which was a uh, shitty little calculator and then you can compare that to where how we're going with quantum computing so first atomic scale transistor 2012 first um integrated circuit now the end of 2021 two years ahead of schedule um so from there you could expect we'll have some kind of commercial products for quantum computing or at least quantum simulators we'll talk about those later uh in about five years or less so be ready. A computer is made up of very simple components doing very simple things, representing data, the means of processing it, and control mechanisms. Computer chips contain modules, which contain logic gates, which contain transistors. A transistor is the simplest form of a data processor in computers, basically a switch that can either block or open the way for information coming through. This information is made up of bits which can be set to either 0 or 1. Combinations of several bits are used to represent more complex information. Transistors I think it can be explained even more simply than that. So if you have a transistor, you can imagine it as an open gate or a closed gate. So when it's, when it's uh, open, electricity can't flow, right? When it's closed, electricity can flow. And so we're just arbitrarily defining, you know, an open gate where there's no electricity flowing as zero. And when it's closed as one, it's very arbitrary. The zeros and ones don't really mean anything. They What they translate to is electricity flowing, no electricity flowing. 
that's why you can only, you know, sort of, that's why everything at the, the base level machine code is zeros and ones. That's why we, when we say zeros and ones, that's what we mean. Uh, and then in programming, you can go higher and higher level to, you know, where you get to like Python. Um, but all Python is written in lower level languages like C and then down to even machine code, which is you get to ones and zeros. Uh, so it's pretty incredible if you go on a deep dive into how computers work. Uh, and you'll have to if you want to understand how quantum computers work. So now quantum computers, um, <coughs> you have instead of bits, which are the ones and zeros, open, closed circuit, you have qubits. Uh, and you've probably heard how they can be in like a one, a zero, or a zero and one at the same time, right? And that is kind of confusing for a lot of people. And what, like, what does that even mean? Well, you know, there's many ways to do this. And one way to do it is by using the spin of atoms or electrons. Um, and one way we're going to talk about a lot in this video is uh, uh, using silicon uh, uh, qubits. So you can actually, as particularly with nuclei of atoms, uh, the nuclei have spin just like electrons. And we'll talk about what spin is very briefly because, you know, that needs a whole video and it's extremely complicated. <laughs> but um, the spin, you know, it can either be, as we say, spin up or spin down, which is very arbitrary. So we're not going to go any deeper into what spin is in this video, but I'll, I'll just say it, it's an intrinsic form of angular momentum. Um, so all particles have it and composite particles, hadrons, and uh, nuclei. But it's it, it, the analogy of something spinning, it, it doesn't work. Uh, so let's just leave it at that for now. And so with the qubits, you can store information, quantum information as, you know, ones or zeros, but you can also do a combination of the two states. You could do like 70%, uh, you know, up, 30% down, or like one or zero. Uh, but the problem is the, the the combinations of states, they're very uh, fragile and it's very hard to get them to stay in those uh, combinations for very long. So that's a major problem we'll talk about and a bit of an elephant in the room for, you know, the hardware approach that Google and IBM are taking. Uh, they're having a real problem with uh, keeping uh, a lot of the, the quantum states stable. They're, I think the current record is like 100 microseconds which is awful. You know, if you want to need to do an actually useful calculation, you're going to need to be able to keep the, you know, the qubits in, in, in these superpositions for longer than that. Uh, and then you can manipulate these qubits with microwaves or magnetic fields, different ways of doing this. Are combined to create logic gates, which still do very simple stuff. For example, an AND gate sends an output of one if all of its inputs are one and an output of zero otherwise combinations of logic gates finally form meaningful modules, say for adding two numbers. Once you can add, you can also multiply, and once you can multiply, you can basically do anything. Since all basic operations are literally simpler than first grade math, you can imagine a computer as a group of seven-year-olds answering really basic math questions. A large enough bunch of them could compute anything from astrophysics to Zelda. However, with parts getting tinier and tinier, quantum physics are making things tricky. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, a transistor is just an electric switch. Electricity is electrons moving from one place to another, so a switch is a passage that can block... So I don't know if you know, but yeah, um, in electrical circuits, electrons aren't actually flowing. So that's, that's a very complicated and convoluted discussion, but just keep that in mind. ...electrons from moving in one direction. Today, a typical scale for transistors is 14 nanometers which is about eight times less than the HIV virus's diameter and 500 times smaller than a red blood cells. As transistors are shrinking to the size of only a few atoms, electrons may just transfer themselves to the other side of a blocked passage via a process called quantum tunneling. In the quantum realm, physics works quite differently from the predictable ways we're used to, and traditional computers just stop making sense. We are approaching a real physical... So we're going to skip that one today because that is, a, again, a convoluted thing to talk about. Uh... ...for our technological progress. To solve this problem, scientists are trying to use these unusual quantum properties to their advantage by building quantum computers. In normal computers, bits are the smallest units of information. Quantum computers use qubits, which can also be set to one of two values. A qubit can be any two-level quantum system, such as a spin in a magnetic field or a single photon. 
0 and 1 of this system's possible states, like the photon's horizontal or vertical polarization. In the quantum world, the qubit doesn't have to be in just one of those, it can be in any proportions of both states at once. This is called superposition. But as soon as you test its value, say by sending the photon through a filter, it has to decide to be either vertically or horizontally polarized. So as long as it's unobserved, the qubit is in a superposition of probabilities for 0 and 1, and you can't predict which it will be. But the instant you measure it, it collapses into one of the definite states. It's doing a really great job at this. Is a game changer. So all the hype around quantum computers probably started way back in 1994. That's when it really started to ramp up because a guy called Peter Shaw from MIT basically showed that you could factorize a really large number really quickly with a quantum computer. And the way it does this is by basically representing the factorizations of uh, the number as like quantum waves that can like slosh around simultaneously through the qubits because of their two-way state uh, nature. And so what it does is basically cancels out um, the, the magic of the algorithm. The, the wrong factorizations will cancel out and uh, <clears throat> the correct ones just pop out. So you could break encryption of like uh, internet communication with this quite easily as well, which is scary and a bunch of other things. So it is, you know, th this is why there's so much hype around it. So the encryption systems that basically secure the internet currently uh, basically rely on uh, the fact that classical computers, like the one in front of you probably, they just can't handle factorizing really large numbers. It just They just get overwhelmed very easily. And that's why in current encryption, you know, is pretty safe from, you know, normal hacking. There's a big problem though, because Shaw basically assumed that, um, you know, these qubit, these, these quantum waves would be able to slosh around the qubits for as long as they want. Uh, so, you know, it can calculate things that take longer, even on the quantum computer. But unfortunately, that's not the case with uh, the hardware Google and IBM are building. Unfortunately, they can't slosh around for very long at all, like a fraction of a second. You're talking like 100 microseconds on Google's one. So Google and IBM specifically use qubits made of uh, tiny resonating circuits of superconducting metal etched onto like these little microchips. And they did that because at the time when they started constructing them, they were the best, that was the easiest way to in, uh, manipulate the qubits and to create these chips. But that's all changed. There's been a paradigm shift as of late with huge breakthroughs coming out of Australia of all places. And uh, we can now do this with silicon and at the atomic scale, like literally atoms. So instead of using, um, you know, metal etched onto, you know, these microchips or like cavities and you have to manipulate them with microwaves or even uh, ma magnetism, you can now do this in a much more simple way uh, you can actually use something called electric nuclear resonance so we'll talk about that soon because that discovery is just mind-blowing and it really changes everything um, but there's also some other huge advantages of using these new breakthroughs to do it on silicon and so there's a there's a couple teams in australia which are kind of competing um, one is called silicon quantum computing and their researchers out of university of sydney they're that's a really interesting paradigm as well. I'll, I'll talk about that. But my, the one I think is going to win this race, at least the hardware that we're going to use to get there, uh, they are basically using, uh, they, they, they put nuclei of atoms into, um, they entangle them with the electrons of atoms. And you can do this with phosphorus. And um, then you take that electron to another atom and you can entangle that with uh, another nucleus. And they recently showed, like a really recent Nature paper, like I think a couple of weeks ago or a month, um, that you can get error fidelities like uh, of up to like 99.95%. So that's, that's incredible, basically error free. Uh, and the error correction they can do now basically uh, finds the errors quicker than they arise. That is a game changer because Google and IBM currently, they're just plagued with this error correction problem and it seems like they're kind of struggling so it's really looking like silicon electric uh, nuclear resonance is probably going to be the way to go um, and then also out of Australia Michelle Simons who runs that silicon quantum computing she uh, literally as well like a month ago just um, created the first ever uh, atomic scale quantum integrated circuit so 
that which is just mind blowing. Um, she was also the first her team in 2012 to create the first atomic scale transistor made out of atoms. And so this integrated circuit, um, they basically created a quantum simulator, which is different to a quantum computer because you can't reprogram it. And so they modeled, um, what was the molecule? I think it was carbon. Um, and so it basically emulated what carbon does. Um, but you can't reprogram it, unfortunately. That's the next stage. That Silicon quantum computing, the company, they're aiming to have a useful quantum computer by, I think, 2028, so approximately five years. Um, and I think they can do it. And they have a really interesting lab, which took, I think, like 20 years to make. Uh, it's like this building within a building that's kind of like floating uh, to, you know, to get rid of all the noise and, you know, movement of the building. Because as they build these chips made out of silicon atom by atom you know you can imagine that's a very delicate process uh it's just incredible so that silicon quantum computing they're going to be using uh quantum dots i believe uh where you literally are going to be using the, the qubits will literally be atoms uh they'll just be you know electrons so it's just mind-blowing the sort of fidelity we're approaching uh and i really do think uh useful quantum computers are going to be built with silicon uh, because once you get less than one percent error rates with the tech uh, that basically opens up the semiconductor industry which is you know there's a lot of infrastructure for it already um, and then we can easily you know transition to making well not easily it'll it's very hard but to make uh, chips for quantum computers Four classical bits can be in one of two to the power of four different configurations at a time. That's 16 possible combinations, out of which you can use just one. Four qubits in superposition, however, can be in all of those 16 combinations at once. This number grows exponentially with each extra qubit. 20 of them can already store a million values in parallel. A really weird and unintuitive property qubits can have is entanglement, a close connection that makes each of the qubits react to a change in the other's state instantaneously, no matter how far they are apart. This means that when measuring just one entangled qubit, you can directly deduce properties of its partners without having to look. Qubit manipulation is a mind-bender as well. A normal logic gate gets a simple set of inputs and produces one definite output. A, a quantum Quantum gate manipulates an input of superpositions, rotates probabilities, and produces another superposition as its output. So a quantum computer sets up some qubits, applies quantum gates to entangle them and manipulate probabilities, and finally measures the outcome, collapsing superpositions to an actual sequence of zeros and ones. What this means is that you get the entire lot of calculations that are possible with your setup all done at the same time. Oh, ultimate no. They're not done at the same time. Quantum computers don't calculate everything at once. That's a little bit incorrect. I just want to emphasize, uh, you guys should be very, very skeptical of what you read about quantum computers on the internet because so much of it is just absolutely wrong. Um, for instance, like you see so many places claiming that quantum computers calculate a bunch of things at the same time. No, they do not. You'll see that, you know, with just a small number of qubits, it'll have more, you'll be able to st store more data than atoms in the universe. That's not true. Um, you'll need quite a few for that. And uh, well, like, basically, if it doesn't involve transforming an NP problem into a P problem, uh, I would be a little bit skeptical. And that, you know, there's only <laughs> limited cases of that as well. You know, sometimes it works, theoretically. So, you know, just be skeptical of what you read about quantum computers. A lot of people in software and computer science talk about it, but unfortunately they don't know the physics behind it. And that, that is a bit of a bottleneck. You can only measure one of the results and it will only probably be the one you want. So you may have to double check and try again. But by cleverly exploiting superposition and entanglement, this can be exponentially more efficient than would ever be possible on a normal computer. So while quantum computers will probably not replace our home computers, in some areas they are vastly superior. One of them is database searching. To find something in a database, a normal computer may have to test every single one of its entries. Quantum algorithms need only the square root of that time, which for large databases is a huge difference. The most famous use of quantum computers is ruining IT security. Right now, your browsing, email and banking data is being kept secure by an encryption system in which you give everyone a public key to encode messages only you can decode. 
The problem is that this public key can actually be used to calculate your secret private key. Luckily, doing the necessary math on any normal computer would literally take years of trial and error. You're but talking millions to billions of years, by the way. A computer with exponential speed up could do it in a breeze. Yep. Another really exciting. That's new why, uh, yeah, RSA, ECC, elliptic curve encryption, uh, and Bitcoin—they're all at risk. So if you're into cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, all that sort of jazz, it's probably time to start worrying because a lot of people don't realize that uh, powerful quantum computers will actually be able to kind of ruin cryptocurrencies in general. So it's actually pretty straightforward as to why cryptocurrencies are kind of at risk if these powerful quantum computers already exist and for when they're coming in the future. And if, you know, hackers or governments just want to steal data currently and, you know, they can retroactively break the encryption. And that's because every time you make a transaction with a cryptocurrency, you're exposing your public key, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Like everyone knows this, but if you have a powerful enough quantum computer, you will potentially be able to, uh, it, with classical computers, it'll take billions of years, millions to billions. Um, but with, with the public key, you'll actually be able to probably um, derive the private key. So if you have the private key, well, then you can do whatever you want. You can make transactions. And so you can kind of see quantum computers are a real problem for cryptocurrencies in general. Um, so a lot of people don't seem to think, you know, we need to worry at all. But it's like, why wouldn't we start preparing for that if it's kind of coming? You know what I mean? And again, it might already be here. So let's quickly talk about why <coughs> these crappy quantum computers haven't been able to basically break um, public, private key cryptography yet. So that's basically because we haven't made quantum circuits big enough yet. It's coming though. Um, and so I think a good source to, I think Microsoft published a paper which said, you know, about 4,000 um qubits a, a circuit will be able to break um rsa encryption and then to break elliptic curve uh encryption i think it was like 2500 qubits which we're not there yet you know the, what's the record like you know within the just over 100 qubits and you got to also remember that microsoft paper that was accounting for you know ideal circumstance in physics was always ideal ideal this and so these qubits are like in perfect uh, <laughs> harmony and it's just not reality uh, it, you'd need a lot more qubits than that to really do it in reality um, you'd, and that's we can do that <clears throat> when you have enough qubits you can account for the the realistic problems via error correction and this happens in normal computers as well and classical error correction is actually pretty easy because you can basically just copy the bits um, so if you you know if there's an error you, you you have a copy quantum computers you can't copy the qubits um because there's something called the no cloning theorem and so the way you do it is by basically having a lot more qubits um traditionally with this quantum error correction but now with what this new research out of australia is showing is uh you can actually get less than one percent uh error rates with entangled qubits if you use uh, uh, the, the paradigm that these researchers are using. My prediction is we're going to have useful quantum computers within the next five years. That's why I've created CalVPN. I think it's very important because as I keep harping on about, I'll say it one more time, you know, there could be hackers around the world, particularly governments, China could be stealing data, very sensitive data, your data, uh, to, you know, with the intention of decrypting it, hacking it, uh, when these computers exist, because I'll explain why they're going to be able to hack them using something called Shaw's algorithm. So we already know it's possible. So why wouldn't they be doing this? I'm pretty techno optimistic uh, in general, and especially with quantum computers from knowing the stuff that I know with the research that I've read. Uh, and I really do think that we might be able to break RSA encryption within the next five years. And this, I don't want to, you know, put my tinfoil hat on too much and <laughs> worry you guys but governments really could have like they could be well ahead in the quantum computing race and they could actually have very sophisticated quantum computers already and now if you're saying hang on a second i like you're going you're getting a bit crazy here well keep in mind that governments have been ahead uh with technology before take for instance the internet darpa uh, be, a lot of the infrastructure was de developed in secret by DARPA. 
Um, so that's the internet, you know, quantum computers is probably pretty comparable to that, you know, paradigm shift of when the internet and the World Wide web became a thing. So I would not be surprised if, uh, America, China does have very secret, you know, pro black technology. Um, and if they do, well, obviously they're not going to tell anyone, you know, they're going to secretly spy on each other. Uh, I think this is actually quite likely. And I think the time to start worrying is right now. Uh, and I think if you go listen to experts talk about this, they say the same stuff, you know, so I don't want you to think I'm going off on the, the wild end of speculation. This is a, the time to worry is now. <laughs> And so this is where CalVPN comes in. It will protect you guys because there is, um, so, so let's talk about it. Okay. So what the, the way it protects you is it's like a normal VPN, right? But it has these post quantum, uh, cryptographic algorithms in it. So you, important thing to note here is, uh, post quantum cryptography is very different to quantum cryptography. All right. They sound nearly the same. So post quantum cryptography, just mathematical problems. There's no special hardware, you know, testing this stuff. That's what CalVPN utilizes. Whereas quantum cryptography, it uses the properties of quantum mechanics to uh, basically, you know, prove that uh, you can't uh, hack it. So you use these quantum properties to create a shared key between two parties. And you can basically provably show that, you know, they could, they, no one saw the key because if they did the the, uh, the communications data would have been destroyed by way of quantum mechanics you know you probably heard about uh the superposition and stuff you know just observing the wave function collapses it stuff like that okay um so again calvpn relies on post-quantum cryptography mathematical equations which uh they should be resistant to all known attacks even if the governments have these powerful quantum computers in their hands they won't be able to get their get their hands on your data if you use calvpn so post quantum cryptographic algorithms are just classical algorithms that can basically withstand uh powerful quantum computers and it doesn't rely on any like uh hardware any uh, complicated quantum hardware uh no, no quantum properties it's just classical stuff so it really does work and it can also protect you from, you know, just powerful computers and supercomputers. If you know what I'm talking about, you might also wonder why we don't just double the key size. Well, that has to do with the fact how quantum computers work. They don't just brute force their way through problems. No, no. So it's that, that doesn't really do anything. But these algorithms that will protect you from quantum computers actually come directly from the submissions to NIST, which is the US uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. And they basically very recently within the last month have announced uh, four uh, algorithms which will set the stage for uh, standard encryption for post quantum uh, encryption, that is. Um, and there's still four other algorithms that they're still looking at to see if they'll work. But this has been, what's, what is it like six year, a six year long competition, uh, to find some algorithms that will be able to protect against quantum com computers. And so basically our software includes these cryptographic algorithms that will protect you and encrypt your data to a degree where, you know, even if quantum computers are stealing data right now, they will never be able to decrypt them. So if you're interested in the specific post quantum algorithms and you want to check them out yourselves, go look up crystals, Kyber. Uh, Crystals, Dilithium, uh, Falcon, and Sphinx. They're the ones that have been currently selected by NIST to, to work, essentially. Uh, and it's awesome. We might talk briefly about them in the dedicated videos that I make. They're just quite complicated. The math is, you know, not straightforward. And the terminology as well, there's a lot to explain. So NIST have really been trying to promote like a sense of urgency uh, to upgrade encryption standards in everything <laughs> on the internet. Uh, all software to promote a sense of urgency. I remember reading that they cited a, uh, a study by the Quantum um, Economic Development Consortia, which basically found that uh, it took a large, a large tech enterprise like five years to transition to advanced encryption standards. So, you know, if you're currently using a VPN, like, uh, you know, NordVPN, Surfshark, all of those big ones, which I've worked with in the past, you know, in sponsorships on this channel. Well, that's the sort of big tech enterprise, which will take a long time to upgrade their encryption standards. Why? Because it's so 
bloody complicated and they probably don't know how you know you they have to hire people to do this and it basically involves changing their software like pretty substantially uh so that's a big problem so if you're already using a vpn i highly recommend you know looking into this further for yourselves and deciding if you want to jump on the cal vpn bandwagon because it's going to take them a long time like even nord vpn it's going to take them a long time to bring in these uh post quantum cryptographic uh, encryption standards i would almost bet you know <laughs> any sum of money it's going to take them a long time and we can already offer protection against them and like i keep saying you know it's no secret that america has developed black technology in the past and they've been ahead in with technology than say universities so it is something we need to worry about now and it's particularly if you're you know interested in cryptocurrencies if you've got Bitcoin, you should definitely consider this. This is simulations. Simulations of the quantum world are very intense on resources, and even for bigger structures such as molecules, they often lack accuracy. So why not simulate quantum physics with actual quantum physics? Mm. Quantum simulations could provide new insights on proteins that might revolutionize medicine. Right now, we don't know if quantum computers will be just a very specialized tool or a big revolution for humanity. We have no idea where the limits of technology are, and there's only one way. I think way. there's a lot of things in principle which we actually do kind of know what quantum computers will be able to do. Um, and it that those things will revolutionize humanity. We really have no idea to the extent at which quantum computers could revolutionize everything, like society itself. Uh, and to give you a little bit of an insight into this, like uh, when after 1994, when uh, we discovered, you know, these quantum algorithms, we basically uh, realized that uh, in principle, quantum computers would be able to do things that would just be like impossible on classical computers. And it seemed like researchers at the time got really excited by that. Uh, and they expected to find a lot of different quantum algorithms that would be able to, you know, do incredible things. And people have described it as a bit of a bummer trajectory because like I said, people were expecting to find a huge range of things you could do with these quantum algorithms, but nope. We basically realized that quantum computers were only going to offer like a really big speed up to a very narrow uh, single class of problems uh, within a standard set called NP. If you've never heard of NP problems, you should go look into those. Uh, but they're basically ones that have efficiently verifiable solutions. So like factoring, right? Uh, and so that was, that's been the case for like three decades. Bit of a bummer. But very recently, we've we've found a uh, an entirely new problem that quantum computers are going to be able to solve exponentially faster than classical computers. So that's really exciting. But we're not sure if it's like a standalone problem or if the, it's part of a new whole sort of you know set of problems. We just don't know. Uh, it basically involves calculating like really complex inputs of a mathematical process. Uh, from only its jumbled outputs. So it's just a completely new new problem. So that's very exciting. 